One of the things which determines the kind of civilization we live in is the amount of power we have available to do work for us. It's true for the modern city, but it was also true for a frontier log cabin. Looking at a drawing of young Abraham Lincoln studying in front of a fireplace does not automatically make us think about power. But the heat and light from the firewood was the power he used while he studied. When you stop to think about it, he really was using the power of his own muscles. He split the wood, carried it into the house, and kept the fire going. The same thing was true of almost every other way he used power, in clearing land, planting and harvesting crops, or building a home. Those amounts of power wouldn't go very far today. We use more power than the pioneers ever dreamed of. Automatic heat instead of a fireplace. Electric lights for studying. Motors to do many jobs for us. Television and many other things. We know that all this is made possible by electricity, which is a different kind of power brought into our homes from the generating stations where it is made. As our population increases, we will use more and more power. Most electricity is made with heat. Fires boil water into steam, and the steam drives electric generators. Most of the heat now comes from burning coal or oil, but it would not be wise to rely entirely on these fuels to produce the enormous amounts of electricity we will be needing in the years to come. We have to be certain there are ways of producing all the additional heat we will need. Fortunately, we have found the answer, power from the atom. We have learned how to use one kind of atomic power, the power produced by atomic fission. Since this kind of power is the result of splitting or fissioning the nucleus of atoms, it is more accurate to call it nuclear power. And that is the name we will be using as we talk about it. Everything in the world is made up of atoms. They are unbelievably tiny. It takes billions and billions of them to make up the head of a pin. And for a long time, men thought that they were the smallest particles of matter. Some kinds of atoms are always in the process of splitting up or fissioning. When this happens, pieces of matter and energy from inside the atom shoot out and can hit other atoms. This is called radioactivity. It called the attention of scientists to the fact that atoms were not the smallest pieces of matter, but were made up of smaller particles. The most famous discovery about this was when the Curies proved the existence of radium in 1898. From these observations has sprung the whole science of nuclear physics. These discoveries have changed the world in many ways, and one of the most important is the use of atoms as a source of power. We know now that an atom has a core, or nucleus, which is made up of particles called protons and sometimes neutrons. We know that these are held together by some kind of a binding energy. Someone has called it a kind of cosmic glue, and we know that the outer shell of atoms is made up of other particles called electrons, which whirl around the nucleus. The number of protons in the nucleus determined what kind of a chemical element an atom was. When these had been counted, it was possible to give each element an atomic number. This idea had been in use for a long time, even though the reason why it worked was not well understood, and elements had been sorted out by numbers in a chart. But the new knowledge of atomic structure added another important way of sorting out the different kinds of atoms. This was to identify them by their atomic weight, and the atomic weight turned out to be the total number of both the protons and neutrons in the atom's nucleus. Lightest of them all is hydrogen. It has just one proton in its nucleus, so it has an atomic weight of one. Oxygen is heavier. Eight protons and eight neutrons give it an atomic weight of 16. Iron, with 26 protons and 29 neutrons, weighs in at 55. Gold is a heavyweight. He tips the scales way up at 197. And near the upper end of the scale is uranium, heaviest of all the elements which occur in nature. With 92 protons and 146 neutrons, uranium has an atomic weight of 238. Now that we have gone to all this trouble to learn how to identify atoms by their weight, we have to realize that the weights are not always exactly the same for any particular element. The fact is that every element has some atoms which have a different number of neutrons. This does not change them into different elements, 
Only a change in the number of protons could do that. But it does make them into slightly different kinds of the same element. You might say that they are twin relatives of the most common form of the element. These slightly different forms of the same element are called isotopes, and the differences are very important in determining what an atom can do and what we can do with it. A nuclear scientist identifies an isotope by adding its atomic weight to the name of the element. Just saying uranium doesn't tell him all he needs to know. It makes a big difference whether he is dealing with uranium-238 or uranium-235, for example. He also simplifies things by using the chemical symbol for the element instead of its full name, U-235, instead of saying uranium-235. To understand why it is so important to specify the particular isotope, let's take a look at the two principal forms of uranium. One of them is the most important nuclear reactor fuel being used for power generation today. Over 99% of all the uranium in the world is U-238. Only a tiny part of the natural uranium is the isotope U-235, and it is this small part which we are using to run nuclear power plants. The reason is interesting. Nuclear power is created when the nucleus of an atom splits or fissions. So we have to choose atoms which can fission as easily as possible. It happens that the nucleus of an atom of U-235 isn't glued together quite as strongly as the nucleus of U-238. And that fact makes U-235 one of the three nuclear fuels we have available. We know that the nucleus of an atom consists of protons, neutrons, and the binding energy which holds them together. When an atom fissions, it breaks up into two lighter atoms. Neutrons fly out like tiny bullets, and some of the binding energy flies out with them. Part of this binding energy is released as radiation, something like x-rays, and the rest is changed into heat. This is where the heat comes from, which we use to drive nuclear power plants. To get the huge amounts of heat it takes to generate large quantities of electricity, we must have billions and billions of atoms fissioning. There are so many atoms in a small amount of matter that this works out very well. Here is one way of illustrating just how true this is. The amount of heat which could be produced by fissioning the atoms in a piece of nuclear fuel the size of a baseball is about the same as we could get by burning 18,000 tons of coal but we had to learn how to do it. In 1942, at the University of Chicago, Dr. Enrico Fermi and his associates used U-235 in an experiment which began the age of atomic power. They produced the world's first nuclear chain reaction and proved that they could control it with absolute precision. They used the neutrons released when atoms of U-235 split apart as bullets which struck the nuclei of other uranium atoms, splitting them. This released still more neutrons, which split more atoms, and the process kept itself going. By inserting rods of a material which soaked up flying neutrons, they could control the speed of the chain reaction, or shut it down altogether. We have already pointed out that only a very small part of uranium, called U-235, is useful as a nuclear fuel. Because of this, it is called a fissionable material. This means that its atoms can be split to sustain a chain reaction. Most natural uranium is U-238. It is not a nuclear fuel because its atoms cannot be split. But it is called a fertile material because it can be changed into another element which will split atoms in a chain reaction. That element is called plutonium-239. There is another element which can be made into a nuclear fuel in the same way. That is called thorium-232. It is possible to change this thorium into an isotope of uranium, U-233, which is the third fissionable material, and will run a reactor just as U-235 does. The method of changing fertile into fissionable materials is somewhat similar to the way we make nuclear power. The fertile material, either U-238 or TH-232, is placed in a reactor with some U-235. But something very different from a chain reaction takes place. 
Instead of fissioning when struck by neutrons from the U-235, the fertile material captures a neutron and changes into the fissionable isotope. This process is called breeding, and some of it takes place in all nuclear reactors. But there are specially designed reactors which do a great deal more of this changing of elements than others. They are called breeder reactors, and they do something which sounds quite impossible. In addition to producing power, they make more fuel than they use up. After such a reactor has been in operation for a few months, there will be more fuel in it than there was to begin with. This is a very important point in the story of nuclear energy. Without breeding, converting fertile materials into fissionable materials, most of our supply of nuclear energy would have to come from that small amount of natural uranium which is capable of sustaining a chain reaction. All the rest would be useless to us. In breeder reactors, we will be able to convert the rest of the uranium and the thorium into more fuel. And when we do that, we will open up the greatest storehouse of energy mankind has ever had. Meanwhile, the amount of power we can produce from the natural U-235 will keep our electric systems well supplied. These stations are so important to our future that we will learn how they work. We have seen the basic principles of atomic or nuclear energy. We saw how atoms are made up of protons and neutrons bound together in a nucleus and the shells of whirling electrons. How atoms of different chemical elements have different numbers of protons in their nuclei. We found that there was a way in which atoms could be different from each other and still be atoms of the same element. By having different numbers of neutrons in the nucleus, we could have twin relatives of atoms, still the same chemical element, but a little different from the most common form. These twins of the elements are called isotopes. Some isotopes are naturally splitting up or fissioning. This means that these atoms are breaking apart. When this happens, some of the binding energy which holds the nucleus together is changed into radiation, similar to X-rays, and some of it is changed into heat. But in addition to this, some of the neutrons fly out of the atom and hit other atoms. If these neutron bullets strike the nucleus of an atom which is not too tightly glued together, they can cause that atom to split. This creates more radiation, more heat, and releases still more neutrons which can split more atoms. This is called a controlled chain reaction. We also have found that there are some materials called fertile materials which can be changed into fissionable materials and used as nuclear fuel. Between now and the end of this century, nuclear power plants will become a very large part of our sources of electricity. An understanding of the basic principles of nuclear power is very important to understanding how the growing electrical needs of this country will be met during those years. Thank you.